anyhow, as Peter's been giving this talk about Shaky. Um, Shaky made a big impression on me when I first saw it in, in the early 60s in, you know, in a Scientific American article. So it's where I first got interested in robotics. So I'd like to introduce Peter Hart, and he's going to tell us all about Shaky. Thank you very much. Is this working for everybody? Yep. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I'd like to tell you a story tonight. And this is a story about how a small group of researchers were inspired by a brilliant renegade physicist named Charlie Rosen, who, by the way, co-authored the world's first textbook on transistors before he started doing robots, um, who uh, got together at SRI to um, make the world's first intelligent robot. Uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you how we got started, how we approached this brand new world of robotics, a few of the things we actually did, and what the impact has been on today's technology and really on all of our everyday lives. Along the way, I'll show you some of the reactions that people had to Shaky, and I'll close with some thoughts about the possible future, tra uh, future trajectory for intelligent robots. But just to get you in the mood, let me give you a, a little preview of what a Shaky do. So what Shaky could do was it could perceive its surroundings, it could logically deduce implicit facts from explicit facts, it could do things like plan routes and navigate, it could automatically construct plans consisting of a sequence of steps in order to solve problems that were beyond the reach of any pre-programmed uh, action that it had. Um, and it could learn in certain ways, and it could communicate with us uh, to a certain extent with limited English. So here's a proposal that launched it all from the Artificial Intelligence Center of Stanford Research Institute, now called SRI International, to ARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And uh, that proposal was um, delivered, as you see, 51 years ago. Um, you have to keep that time frame in mind. And as you see, it was the same year that the Stanford Computer Science Department was founded, so this was really very early days for computer science. Here's Charlie and the automaton, as he initially referred to it. I think because he was a little worried that if we called it a robot, nobody would take us seriously, because you have to remember that until shaky, robots literally existed only as works of fiction. So uh, we didn't want to be science fiction, we wanted to be the real deal. But after a while, Charlie and all the rest of us started calling Shaky a robot. Here's Shaky in a little bit more detail. Um, starting from the bottom, does it have a laser pointer? Would that work here? I think I do. Does this work? Well, let's see, I'll just pick one of these. So starting at the bottom, we put the drive wheels on the side so that we could steer Shaky by pivoting them. And we drove them with stepping motors so we could count the pulses and use that for dead reckoning. And those, um, those um, stepping motors are what impart that Shaky movement that you saw in the little video clip, which of course started out life as a 16 millimeter movie. Um, the main sensor was a TV camera, Viticon tube TV camera, uh, for which we had to build our own A to D converter because there was no such thing as screen grabbers then. And by the way, that video camera, that uh, Viticon tube, gave us a full 120 lines of resolution, um, four bits deep, so we had 16 levels from white to black. We augmented the camera with a homemade laser rangefinder with a rotating uh, mirror in this upper housing and a pickup lens down below. There was really no onboard computing. This uh, little half a rack was just communications and registers for drivers for the, for the various motors. Uh, all the communication was done off-robot on a 
timeshare mainframe that I'll tell you about in a moment uh, over this radio link. And by the way, before we had the radio link, we took us forever to get uh, permission from the FCC for an experimental link, so we had a big cumbersome overhead cable thing going on. Five time, I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, we had cat whisker bumpers, little wire uh, bump detectors, and later we, uh, later we had a little push bar. The whole thing was driven, uh, powered by the way, by Sears truck batteries, nothing fancy. There were two ground rules behind this design. The first was that we wanted to minimize mechanical complexity, and so we never installed the two arms that the initial design uh, called for. Uh, and the second was that we didn't want to expend any resources on miniaturization or anthropomorphizing, anthropomorphizing uh, the robot. And that accounts for its blocky shape. It's basically an electronics rack on wheels um, with a little sensor assembly on top. Well, we were very aware of how limited Shakey's mechanical and sensory capabilities are, and so we, um, we designed a correspondingly simple indoor environment consisting of a half a dozen rooms uh, with doorways, but no physical doors uh, connecting them. And the walls were about this high, so we could see over the top, but Shakey could not. We populated the rooms with these um, big blocks, and we painted them in these colors so that Shaky had a chance of detecting edges visually with a pretty uh, primitive video, while at the same time reflecting enough light for the laser rangefinder to work. And here you can see up here a little hint of the original uh, cable assembly that went up through a big pulley in the ceiling. Later when we had the radio, we noticed now and then that Shaky would stop and do a 360 degree pirouette we're in the middle of doing something and then just continue like nothing happened. What the hell is that all about? And somebody drilled down and sound, found some vestigial coat to unwind the cable if it got too twisted up. <laughs> so our first computer was an early time-shared mainframe, an SDS 940, that had all of 192 kilobytes of main memory, which by the way is less than the L2 cache in my old laptop over here. Um, but a few years later, we, uh, we um, upgraded to a much more powerful DEC PDP-10 running 10X. Um, I remember signing off on that machine, so it was like really big. And the biggest single rack was a uh, Bryant rotating magnetic drum that was bigger than a refrigerator. And it was used for swapping timeshare jo <coughs> jobs in and out. And I still remember that that had a little over a megabyte 256k, 36 bit words, and um, in current dollars, I remember when I signed off on it for, in current dollars, it's a million and a half dollars. So just a little over a dollar a byte. Try to get your head around that next time you wander on down to Fry's and get pretty much any kind of memory for practically pocket change. My favorite part of this machine was behind one of these big blank um, cabinet doors, there was a bunch of face plates for the racks, and nothing on any of them except a little 20 cent potentiometer knob, and it said on it, master speed, speed control, slow, fast. And I always wanted, of course, crank it up, but our systems guys told me, don't touch that, Peter, I don't care who you are, you know, that's gonna push the electrical margins and we're gonna start to get, you know, lots of errors. So about the time that we um, installed the KI-10, the PDP-10, uh, we did a major rewrite of Shaky's control software. Um, while not doing very much with the physical hardware, just some minor improvements on the hardware. And so what I'd like to do is tell you about this version two of Shaky, which is the version that achieved its greatest performance, of course. There were two big ideas behind version two of Shaky, and everybody here will recognize that the software was the key and the hardware was pretty primitive, but you're all sophisticated roboticists, so you can get beyond that. Um, the first big idea was to represent Shaky's world by statements in a mathematical logic language called first order predicate calculus. And here you see a little fragment of Shaky's world model. Uh, the first statement, 
I mean, the name sounds intimidating, but it's pretty easy to see what's going on. The first statement says the robots at these coordinates, that the status of door D1 is open, meaning it's not blocked by an object. Uh, object 1 is a box, and so on. So this predicate calculus model, or mathematical logic model, was a major step beyond a grid-like model that we use, kind of a map-like model that was the only model we had in, um, in, version, in version 1. <coughs> the second big idea in version 2 of Shakey's control software was to structure it in this uh, series of four levels, this hierarchy of four levels. And what I'll do is take you quickly from the bottom to the top and tell you a little bit about what each of these did. First, the low-level actions aren't much to talk about. At the very bottom were drivers that loaded registers and shaky and made loaders turn or take a picture and things like that. They were, they were things that like turn the robot's head or roll someplace or stuff like that. So these aren't too interesting. Much more interesting are the intermediate level actions just above those. There were actions like bumble through, which tried to get shaky through a doorway by making small course corrections if it hit the side of the door. Uh, and its big brother go through door. Now, we segregated all of these actions into their own intermediate level because all of them were structured as Markov tables. And to remind you about Markov tables, this is a little simplified version of the Markov table that gets shaky through a doorway. Now, if you remember how these things work, the idea is you scan down the left column until you find the first true predicate, then you execute the corresponding action, and then you loop back to the top. So to get it started here, if Shaky is in front of a door and knows that the status is open, in other words, not blocked, then call our friend Bumble through. If not, if Shaky's near the door and knows that it's open, then call this thing called a line, another intermediate level action. And otherwise, if you're near the door and you don't know whether it's blocked, then take a picture and analyze it, and so on. And as I said, when you do each action, you loop back to the top and start over until you hit an exit condition. Now, one very important property of this Markov table formalism is that it's what you might call persevering. Because of this looping behavior, it keeps trying to do what you ask it to until either it succeeds or it hits a hard failure and say, sorry boss, make this somebody else's problem, kicks it back upstairs. And this will turn out to be very important, as you'll see. But if the Markov tables were the end of the story, Shaky would be very limited in what it could do. It would only be able to solve problems for which it had a pre-programmed solution in the form of one of these Markov tables that we programmed. If we want Shaky to move beyond executing hand routines, it has to be able, on its own, to, compo to compose a series, of a series of actions into a plan. That's the job of STRIPS, the Stanford Research Institute problem solver. That's the next level up in this control hierarchy. So STRIPS came about by combining two hot ideas of the day. The first was the, an idea called means ends analysis that was used by Herb Simon and Alan Newell in their landmark program, The General Problem Solver. That's not your current GPS. Uh, and the way means ends analysis looks, uh, looks at the world is it looks at the current state and looks at the goal you're trying to achieve and then selects an action that in some sense reduces that difference. And then it iterates on that, that creates a search tree, and if you've found a path that eliminates all differences, you've solved the problem. So that was one big idea. The other big idea was the invention of, uh, by a mathematician named J. A. Robinson of something called the resolution theorem proving principle. And this was a provably workable, um, programmable procedure for proving mathematical theorems stated in the language of the first order predicate calculus. Um, shortly after um, Alan came out with that, 
We had a graduate student working with us named Cordell Green who applied that resolution fear improving idea to the design of question answering systems. And then two of my colleagues, Richard Fikes and Nils Nilsson, combined these two ideas, mean sense analysis and resolution to design strips which applies mean sense analysis as a strategy to predicate calculus representations. And that's the chief reason that we moved to the predicate calculus representations in our second version. So <clears throat> that was the idea behind strips. That's what allows Shaky on its own to compose a series of actions to achieve a goal. A little after we did that, we figured out how to generalize strips in a couple of ways. Uh, we figured out how to uh, replace constants in a plan with variables, and we also invented these triangle tables to represent the internal logic of a plan. And this formed the basis of the top level of our four-level control hierarchy, which was our plan, uh, our plan execution executive, which we call PlanX. So in an in a important sense, this plan execution executive really goes to the heart of what it means to control a robot in the real world. So let me take a few minutes to tell you about the what and the why of PlanX before I tell you a little bit about how it actually works. So first, why PlanX? We recognized very early in the project that there was an enormous difference between designing for a physical robot that has to execute in the real world where plans often go wrong and the planning programs up to that point, like the general problem software I mentioned, that only had to print out a plan on paper and it was done. So let me give you an example. Have, has anybody here heard of the monkey and banana problem? That's where there's a monkey that wants to get a banana, but it's hanging too far overhead to reach. So what's it to do? Well, there's a chair nearby, and the monkey figures out what it should do is push the chair over to under the banana, I'm on the chair, reach for the banana, that solves the problem. So, if you gave that problem to the general problem solver, and they did, all you had to do was print out the steps that I just mentioned, and the problem was solved. It didn't have to worry about what happens if, say, the chair tips over while the monkey's pushing it. But we very definitely did have to worry about execution errors, and so that's why we needed something like, uh, like this PlanX executive. So that's the why. So what, what did it do? Well, using these techniques that I'll describe in a moment, PlanX monitored Shaky's real-world execution of a plan. It could detect if something had not gone according to plan, and if so, it could replan from that point, reusing any portions of the initial plan that were still applicable. And so, this plan execution executive, together with those Markov tables that I characterize as persevering, uh, was our solution to the problem of robust real-world execution. And that, of course, continues to be a problem in robotics today that everybody has to address. So finally, how does it work? I mentioned two things, generalized plans and um, these triangle tables. So first, let me talk about generalized plans. By way of example, Let's give Shaky a really easy problem and ask Shaky to block a particular doorway, say D1. And Shaky comes up with just a two-step plan, go over to some nearby box B1, that's step one, and push B1 to in front of doorway D1, now the doorway's blocked, and the problem is solved. Well, we're gonna have to um, save that plan in some form if we wanna monitor its execution. Now, of course, we could save it in exactly the form I just stated it, but it's much more useful if we recognize that the same plan can be used to block any doorway D using any box B. So why is that more useful? Well, for a couple of reasons. Suppose as Shaky starts to execute the plan, somebody comes along and picks up B1 and takes the box away. Shaky goes to where box B1 is supposed to be. Now what? 
Well, using this generalized plan, Shaky can recognize if there's some other box it knows about, say box B2, that's just as good as just have to go substitute B2 for B in the generalized plan, and now, now it's good to go. So that's one reason we like the generalized plan. A second reason is once the plan is available in generalized form, Shaky can learn it in the sense of storing it for use of a, in a future planning problem. And at that point, it has the same logical status as those Markov uh, processes that I described that we pre-program. So problem solving ability gets better and better. So that's the idea behind generalized plans. Now, what about these Markov tables? Uh, these are triangle tables, rather. Well, they capture an intuition that's very simple to understand for all of us because it applies to all linear plans, whether it's mine or yours or Shakey's. And the intuition there is that every step of the plan is there for one of two purposes. Either it achieves a goal condition or it sets up some conditions that's required by a subsequent step. That's the reason you have a plan and that's what the logical status of steps are. And that's what's captured by, uh, by the triangle table. I won't go into the details on this, but it represents for every step in the plan exactly what has to be true in the, wor in the real world for the remaining steps of the plan to be successfully executed. Why is that important? Well, again, because the world is a dynamic place. Lots of things might be changing as Shaky executes the plan. And the question is, will any of those changes prevent Shaky from completing the execution? And the answer is, only if something changes in those necessary conditions. If none of them change, ignore everything else, just keep going. If anything changes, time to replan. So that's the idea behind Planix, and that was probably the biggest single difference on the symbolic logic side, not the sensing side, but the symbolic logic side, that differentiated the world's first intelligent robot from all of the AI programs that came before. Well, in addition to the software control structure, we developed quite a few specific algorithms for uh, very particular purposes. And next, I'd like to tell you about two of them that turned out to be important. One was what I'll call the invention of the modern form of the Huff transform. And the other is the invention of the A-star algorithm for computing shortest routes. So first, the Huff transform. So this is a method for detecting lines and curves in images. And there's a story behind it. In 1962, Paul Huff patented a very clever method for detecting collinear dots or points in an image. And his idea was to transform each point in the image plane into a straight line in a transform space. And it's easily proved that intersecting lines in the transform space correspond to collinear points in the image space. It's a very clever idea, but it had a very serious computational flaw. And the computational flaw was that the transform space was unbounded in extent, which is kind of inconvenient if you want to represent things in arrays. Um, and so nobody used it. I was working on Shaky's vision system, and I was looking into a branch of 19th century mathematics called integral geometry. And I learned that mathematicians had very good reasons for representing straight lines by something called a normal form of the line that involves sines and cosines, and not a slope-intercept form that I learned in high school, and I guess Huff did too, because that's what he used. <clears throat> I saw that if we swapped out the slope-intercept form for the sinusoidal form, we get a transform space with it, which is both tightly bounded and also invariant to rotation. And so that, of course, is what's been used ever since. Dick Duda and I also figured out how to extend this method to detect arcs in pictures, like um, points on an arc of a circle or, say, a parabola. So that was the invention of the modern form of the Huff transform. Um, we certainly real, uh, recognized that Shaky had to be able to find its way around, so it had to be able to navigate. So we invented two or three different algorithms, and my colleague Nils Nelson and Bert Rayfield and I <clears throat> invented one that we called a star that we were super excited about. <clears throat> Why? Because we could mathematically prove that a star has two very desirable properties. First, it always works. 
we can mathematically prove that it will always find the shortest or least cost path. And second, it's computationally efficient. It does, by a certain measure, the absolute minimum amount of computation of any algorithm that works. So we were very excited about this, thought it was super cool. And so, of course, we were eager to break into print with this great new result. But, uh-oh, here's a rejection letter from the most prestigious journal of the day, the ACM, politely telling us to go peddle our manuscript somewhere else, which we did. And after several more shoot downs, we eventually got it um, accepted in what I used to impolitely refer to as the IEEE transactions on miscellany. But that's not the real name. It's actually called the Transactions on System Science and Cybernetics. <clears throat> but um, it, um, it uh, did get published, although it took us an extra year and eventually got noticed. So that's something about what we were doing. What was the rest of the world <laughs> thinking about while we were doing this? Here is um, the cover of a very popular magazine of the day, Life Magazine, that in 1970 ran a cover story on co-ed dorms. And inside there was a big spread on shaky, spelled incorrectly, by a journalist named Brad Darrick. Now, Brad, in my opinion, hyperventilated just a bit. I'm not sure if you can um, read this up heading on the left there, but he talks about the fearsome reality of a machine with a mind of its own. And that was kind of the, uh, that was kind of the tenor of the article. But while some like Brad thought that robots would take over the world, there were very definitely uh, skeptics. Bert Dreyfus over at UC Berkeley argued on deep philosophical grounds that AI was not merely difficult, but that it was in principle impossible and you'll never get there. You're like a monkey climbing a tree and claiming you're making progress getting to the moon. Um, one day I <clears throat> drove up to Berkeley and debated Bert in front of a standing room only audience in a huge UC lecture hall, and all I can tell you is that after an hour and a half or so, neither of us had made the slightest dent in the other guy's opinions. And somewhere between Brad and Bert were labor union leaders who visited us, and they worried that robots might someday take manufacturing jobs. And of course, they're the ones who turned out to be correct, as you see in this graph of the install base of manufacturing robots worldwide. Other reactions to Shaky came from visitors, and we had a boatload of them because we had kind of an open door policy. There were no badges in those days, and we invited pretty much anybody. So there was a group of school teachers who came, and we showed the kids Shaky, and one of the teachers came to me as they were leaving, and she said to me, well, Dr. Hart, she said, um, what do you really do around here? <laughs> you pardon? She said, well, what's your real job? She said, this robot's a hobby, isn't it? In a matter of speaking. Then there was this kid uh, from Seattle that somehow or other heard about Shaky and drove down with his buddy Paul Allen to see the real thing. And um, 30, 40 years later, he was talking to Eric Corvus, a friend of mine who works at Microsoft, and told him that Shaky made a big impression, um, especially uh, solving a version of the monkey banana problem. Maybe I should tell you about that since I talked to the monkey banana. We wanted to make a version for Shaky to solve, but of course Shaky couldn't climb on a chair or reach for a banana. So instead we built a very low platform, put a box on it, and asked Shaky to push the box off the platform. Well, Shaky, of course, couldn't climb on a platform any more than he climb on a chair. But we also provided a big ramp that Shaky could push around. And Shaky did find the plan, go to the ramp, push the ramp to the platform, roll up the ramp to be on top of the platform, go over to where the box is, push the box off the platform. Actually executed that plan and made a big impression on this guy everybody recognized, I assume he recognizes Bill Gates. High school age, Bill Gates, I guess. Then um, the famous Arthur C. Clarke came to visit us just when the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey had come out. And uh, we sat the great, uh, the great, uh, <clears throat> he became Sir Arthur, I think, in a chair and Shaky did everything Shaky could possibly do for him. But I think Arthur recognized that it would be a while before 
we were ahead of the um, HAL computer in 2001. My personal, personally most memorable visitor was a government auditor who visited me one day. So uh, we have government contracts every now and then again. The government would send an auditor to make sure that the taxpayer's money was being well spent. And you know, I was a guy in charge, so I was told, "Be on your good behavior." You know, the auditor's comment, which I interpret as meaning "Don't drool." And uh, so this guy shows up in my office with a bulging briefcase. Doesn't. No preliminary, he doesn't say so much as hello, sits down, pulls out a file, and he says, Dr. Hart, this really kind of military way, says, it says here that you've taken delivery of an eight billion and something other packets of bits. Is that correct? <laughs> well, I hadn't seen that one coming. <laughs> but he was the auditor, I was on my best behavior, so I said, well, it sounds about right, I can check it for you. No, no, that's fine, then he checks it off. And he says, Dr. Hart, he said, um, did you set up inspection procedures to inspect the condition of these incoming packets? I thought to myself, well, you know, there's got to be an error detecting code somewhere in the communication path. Close enough for government work. So I crossed my fingers and said yes, and he checked it off. And then his best question, he said, Dr. Hart, he said, did these packets arrive in good condition? So was there any tarnish or corrosion on any of the bits? No, sir. Not a speck of tarnish or corrosion on any of the bits. He checked that off, and he asked if I had adequate warehousing facilities, and I thought, didn't you see all those disk drives in the machine room across from my office? But I just said yes, and he thanked me and left. So that's the way the world was back then. Well, that was then, <clears throat> this is now, what's happened in between? Has Shaky had any long-term impact? The answer is yes. <clears throat> really, quite a lot, as you can see in this um, quote from James Kuffner, who until quite recently uh, ran robotics research at Google, and I think just a couple of months or so ago went to the new um, Toyota lab, if I recall, Toyota Research Center. So James said, it's truly amazing how both in terms of architecture and algorithms, the Shaky project was ahead of its time and became a model for future robot systems for half a century. What in our high-tech world last half a century? <coughs> there are about a half a dozen different areas where it's easy to trace Shaky's legacy down to the present day. And I'll go through each of these briefly and I uh, thank my friend and colleague Nils Nilsson for digging these examples up. The first is aging control structures. I made a big point about how real-world execution monitoring and error correction was so important for us doing the world's first mobile intelligent robot and really for pretty much all subsequent ones. So this hierarchical design has been employed by lots of subsequent robots. Uh, Sebastian Thrun told me that he used very similar, actually identical architecture for the control stack for Stanley, which won the DARPA grant challenge about 10 years ago. And um, this is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. They've had a series of underwater autonomous robots. This one is a Zephyr, and it uses the same control stack. Now, by the way, why, why does everybody use the same thing we do? I mean, is that because we were all a bunch of geniuses and nobody could have come up with that? No, I don't think that's the case at all. I think it's a solid engineering solution to a stereotypical problem that we all run up against. And, we happen to be first, and so we figured it out, and nobody's figured out something you know, terribly different since then. So I think it's not because we were geniuses, but because we were first. Next is robust ex action execution, and I've emphasized the importance of that. Um, methods derived, by sh uh, derived from Shaky and also from Nils Nilsson's follow-on work at Stanford on tele-reactive systems have been used in lots of subsequent robots, including Will Garage's PR2, and you may be familiar with the Savioke room service robot that's just being, I think, beta tested now. Of course, Savioke was a spin-off from Willow, so it's not surprising. Um, I mentioned that um, in version one of Shaky, we used a map-like model based on a grid, and when you remember the size of our computer memory, you can imagine we were highly motivated to be as efficient as possible. And so we invented this idea of hierarchically decomposing a 
the grid into smaller and smaller cells so that we put the resolution only where it's actually <coughs> needed. So this has come to be called um, adaptive cell decomposition, and Jakey's use of it was is believed to be the first time that that system was used. It's now literally textbook stuff. It's both used in robot plan, path planning, as you see in this quote from a recent paper, and it's also used in three-dimensional lock tree form in computer aided design and manufacturing. And here's a little excerpt of a figure from a CAD CAM book. Uh, so this is now literally textbook stuff. I told you a little bit about STRIPS, the Stanford Research Institute Problem Solver. Um, <clears throat> one thing about STRIPS that I didn't mention is that um, STRIPS use what became called strip rules for describing the logic of an action. And if you take a deep breath and step back a second, you say, I want to build a planning system, and the planning system is going to have various primitives available to it, primitive actions, there has to be some way of describing what the logic of those actions are. And so for strips, we invented these strips rules that were three parts, preconditions, those are the things that have to be satisfied before you can use an action, a delete list, which are items that are no longer true after performing the action, and an add list, things that become true. And this was a solution to what McCarthy and Hayes called the frame problem in artificial intelligence, which is the problem of describing what does not change in the world when other things do change. So this is a pragmatic solution. And these strips rules have been used everywhere. Here's a kind of a genealogy chart that I got from uh, Sheila McElraith. Um, showing a whole um, sequence of subsequent planning programs, all of whom use the same technology. They're applied to important things like planning beer production in Australia. And by the way, they're uh, also used to plan the actions of non-player characters in lots of video games. Next, I mentioned um, navigation and in general heuristic search, and I mentioned the eight star shortest path algorithm. Once we finally got it um, published, it's inspired lots and lots of variants and uh, descendants. There's um, bi-directional A star for planning both ends towards the middle. There's hierarchical A star where you plan local streets at a detailed level and cross-country journeys at a free, uh, freeway level. There's memory-based A star where you save solutions for future problems. They're uh, open field versions of A-star when you're operating not in a street grid where you go to intersections and make turns, but more in open fields that may be broken or somewhat unknown, and you want to plan smooth curves or smooth trajectories. So there are all those and others. Um, <clears throat> this paper gets over 5,000 citations on Google Scholar, by the way. Right now, on Mars today, a version called Field D Star is what's used to navigate the Curiosity rover. And it was also used to navigate all previous Mars rovers, the three previous ones. And of course, everybody here knows there's more or less 45 minute signal transmission time between us and Mars and back, and you can't steer a car when there's 45 minutes between when you step on the gas and you see something happen. So, so, um, so, uh, this stuff has been running on Mars for a long time. Back here on Earth, when you have your driving directions computed by um, your car's GPS or your handheld or a web surface, um, it's a near certain bet that some version of A star is doing the heavy lifting. It's also, by the way, used in pretty much all video games that have characters that have to go someplace because they too have to be navigated and have to compute that. It's also used in parsing applications if you do computational linguistics or compilers or stuff like that. So ASTOR has proven to be a big deal. And finally, I mentioned our invention of the generalized or modern form of the Huff transform. Um, this, um, this sinusoidal transform we invented has been used literally for decades in, appli in applications like visual inspection and manufacturing. But in the last two or three years, it started to appear in cars, um, where it's used to power driver safety features like lane departure warnings. Um, this happens to be a picture 
of the jazz dashboard in my car where this particular feature is called lane keeping assist. Um, now, uh, what it does for you is that if you drift out of lane without signaling, um, it either vibrates the steering wheel in my car, it actually nudges the car back into lane, does something to let you know that something's amiss. Now, manufacturers normally won't tell you how their stuff actually works. But in this case, I know the backstory. Because quite a few years ago, I visited Daimler Benz's huge research campus in Ulm, Germany, and I visited the computer research group that was from my friend of mine there, and he was very proud to show me a prototype of this system, and he said, oh yes, Peter, guess how it works. So this particular case, we know that this, um, this transform is what's powering it, and it makes all the sense in the world, because what else would you do? It, of course, has a front-looking video camera that's looking for lane markings. By the way, this is the third paper I mentioned that has over 5,000 citations on Google Scholar. The other two were the Strips Planner and the A-Star paper. So I mentioned that for a reason. Um, but first, how are, to we, how are we to regard that number 5,000? Is that a big number or a little number? Well, to put a little bit of context around this, if you go to Google Scholar, you'll find that there are fewer than 200 computer scientists in the history of the field, worldwide, living or dead, whose personal lifetime citation count is more than 5,000. That's all the citations to everything that author ever wrote. So to have a single paper with a citation count of over 5,000 <clears throat> is obviously unusual. And to have three separate papers in three quite different areas with that citation count coming from a single project is perhaps an indicator of what the influence of that project has been. Well, let me, um, for the last section of my talk, let me talk about yesterday, today, and tomorrow, past, present, and future. Here's some of the people who made Shaky. Uh, Charlie Rosen is over here. Some people are missing. I used to have a big mustache. And down in front is Helen Chan Wolf who I think has a good claim to being the world's first programmer of robots. So I like to think of Helen as the Lady Ada Lovelace of robotics. And here are some of us today, and you can see none of us have changed at all. <laughs> Nowadays, Shaky is the centerpiece of the AI and robotics exhibit at the Computer History Museum, practically around the corner from where we are right now. It's also a member of the Robot Hall of Fame at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, let me close by looking at some historical perspectives and looking at two other world-changing technologies and seeing how robotics stacks up against them. Keep in mind that version 2 of Shaky first ran about 45 years ago. So in 1885, Carl Benz invented the first gasoline engine-powered car, he patented it a year later. 45 years later, 1930, Ford alone had sold over 15 million Model Ts, and pretty heavy-duty trucks were a commercial reality. That's the automotive space. In 1903, the Wright Brothers Flyer first lifted off the ground in North Carolina. 45 years later, 1948, military aircraft by the tens of thousands had been flying for a long time, but in terms of consumer-facing aviation, commercial air travel was becoming a practical reality for ordinary people. You didn't have to be a millionaire to get on an airplane. So here's Shaky in 71, let's say, and here we are 45 years later. This flight's I guess, a month old or two, a few months old. And where is robotics? Well, as you saw in that previous chart, there are tens of thousands of robot arms, what I'll call dumb arms, in factories. They mostly do things like spot welding and spray painting, by the way. But in terms of consumer-facing robotics, there's really not a lot. Uh, most successful is probably the vacuum cleaner that Rodney Brooks' company um, launched. Um, that sold between, I think, 10 and 15 million copies. Um, and of course, driverless car technology is kind of seeping into commercial uh, automobile practice. But it has to be said that there is nothing in the world of robotics 
it comes close to the scale and impact of aviation and automobiles 45 years after those concepts were first demonstrated. So you might wonder why and what would have the same, cause robotics to have the same impact. So the answer might come from this particular graph, which I'll modestly suggest you burn into your memory. So what this graph shows is the worldwide population of children under five, and the worldwide population of people over the age of 65. And you can see we're just now at a crossover point, aren't we? Now here's why this is so important. There are three things about this that you need to know. The first is that it's unprecedented in the history of our species. Never before have there been more old people than very young people. Second, it's irreversible. It just keeps on going. This is from the United Nations World Population Study, by the way. And third, it's going to have many profound consequences. One consequence is that there are not going to be enough people of working age worldwide to take care of all those older people. If you look at the US today, we import quite a few people from places like the Philippines to work in senior retirement facilities or other kind of healthcare facilities and so forth. But a generation or so from now, there are not going to be enough people in the Philippines to ship over to take care of us. And so this is really something that, if you're my age, may not affect you, but it will certainly affect your children and your grandchildren, which is why I recommend that you sort of keep this in mind. So what to do? Well, cue the robots. Um, <clears throat> my pitch is that mobile intelligent robots for helping older people may be the only practical solution. And I'm not talking about skilled nursing facilities or something very elaborate. Just that older people, most of whom want to remain their own homes as they age, often need a little bit of help. So it's just things like getting dressed or using the bathroom or dealing with the kitchen chores and stuff like that. So um, I'm on this campaign to get the world's roboticist, and this is not a US problem, uh, only to get the world's roboticist uh, working on this. Um, I was in a meeting recently that included some stuff about robot <coughs> robotics and some of the world's most famous roboticists were there and we were talking about it and they said, oh, Peter, you know, this is a really, really hard problem. My answer was, well, yeah, I know that, but you know, if we don't do anything, it'll be just as hard next year as this year, so we might as well get started. There is, of course, stuff, some stuff going on, but I don't think there's anything plausible. There's a lot of work in Japan. Uh, these exo exoskeletons, I think, are a non-starter in terms of home robotics, for example. Um, and by the way, people often think it's only Japan that's getting older, but of course that's not the case at all. Most of Western Europe is just behind uh, Japan in terms of aging, and the U.S. Would, is the low replacement birth rate, and our population would be shrinking if not for immigration. Well, to sum it up, um, what did we achieve? Looking back, just speaking for myself, I have to say, much less than I hoped. <laughs> but really, that's not surprising since our ambitions were as big as all outdoors. But when you see Shakey's le uh, legacy, um, I think we achieved much more than any of us could have recognized or appreciated at the time. So that's my story. Um, 50 years ago, we took a big swing at a big problem. Back then, it took a team, a team of PhDs to get Shaky to do anything interesting. Nowadays, uh, robots are programmed by 11-year-olds. So it's a reminder that we invest in basic research for the same reason that we plant trees. And that's to benefit future generations. Thanks. Bible.
those 8 million bits? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just something. Um, we were, um, SRI AI was one of the initial set of four or five nodes on the ARPANET. And so we didn't actually directly pay for anything. It was all sponsored by ARPA and went through BBNN. BBNN had the first routers, they called them um, TIPS and um, IMPS, interface message, interface message Processor and Terminal Interface Processor, the first routers. So all that stuff was provided by ARPA. We didn't actually, I didn't have to write a check. Yes? Why do you um, advocate healthcare robots instead of, say, burger flipping robots that will free people out to do the healthcare? Because I hadn't thought of it. <laughs> that might be a good idea. But I tend to like try to attack problems directly. Yes? So I, I had a question whether the technology of the time framed the way you thought about solving the problems. Because you had such primitive everything, um, you really couldn't do grandiose solutions. You had to come up with things that could actually work in the craft you had to deal with them. Did, or at least it seemed that way to me, or did you not consider that as a real constraint? You just, you know, no, that, that's a good point. It's a very uh, really important concern. Maybe I should mention that the actual motivation for Shaky was different from the prima facie motivation. I showed you that proposal um, cover page, and it said we were going to build intelligent automata for reconnaissance. So that was a military application. But the scientific motivation was entirely different. Uh, the scientific motivation, and this was Charlie Rosen's inspiration really, was to build an experimental test bed for integrating in one physical system every aspect of artificial intelligence as it was then understood. So we wanted to deal with knowledge representation and logical reasoning, learning, machine perception, uh, planning, language. We even started as the first speech project. Um, and so we, we had no precedents and no models to go by to say, well, what should a robot research project look like? There weren't any. And, but, but this motivation was to uh, frame an experimental domain that put demands on every one of those areas, everything we could think of. And we wanted them all integrated in one system for the first time ever, and it was. And we wanted it in a physical reality and not just in software, and it was. And so that's really what drove everything everything in the project, and we just lived with the limitations. I mean, I, I mentioned that we painted the boxes so we could see them. Another little hack that I did, but I didn't make a point, of it is that I replaced all of the baseboards in the SRI environment that were kind of a light beige with dark brown because I had enough contrast so that I could actually see it against the wall on the floor. And in fact, once we used our transform for that, we could find the baseboards, find the corners of the rooms, and use them as fiducial points. And that was so successful uh, that we were able to use it to update Shaky's position error, which of course accumulated because dead reckoning is not perfect. Uh, and that worked so well we didn't use the range finder nearly as much as we thought we would because the visual processing was pretty much providing good enough information. So it was all, it, the, the mindset was all around how do we integrate all of these things and initially we thought we weren't going to do much research in the individual disciplines until we got into it and discovered nothing existed in those individual disciplines, so we had to work ourselves. But did you artificially simplify the problems because you had such limited equipment? Sure, that's why, that's why the environment was kind of sterile. Uh, we didn't think about going outside, which is much too difficult. Uh, yeah, we, we, had to, we had to create the whole world that we could deal with. Yes? You said that the communication the output was English, was that spoken or written? It, it was typed. You're going to like this also. Um, so I wrote, I don't know how many lines of Lisp, but many. And for a long time, all of it was on a Model 33 teletype. Um, that was, uh, you know, you typed it in, and then it typed a line at a time back at you. So it was, you know, not exactly today's programming environments. Um, 
that was communication, but it would it would type on a teletype in English. Yes. Um, since this was a new territory uh, with, with what I would assume a lot of uncertainty at the time, uh, were you ever urged by government or by administration or by society to implement Asimov's uh, rules of robotics? No, no, we were very aware of it, but we were very, very far from um, <laughs> from meeting them. Okay. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I was just wondering if other... No, no. Yes? I believe in 1961, the technology back then, uh, there might be no transistor yet. The circuit, the circuit that you use may be just uh, using the vacuum tube. Well, you have to remember, this was more like 71, not 61. 71. Yeah. But so, so the computers were all solid state. Um, now, I mean, if I think back, it might be that 1962, the biggest package might have been two flip-flops or something like that. I don't remember exactly. You didn't have an Intel Pentium on a chip in 1967. Um, but everything was solid state, both on the robot and in the computers. Yes? If you, re if you revisited Shinky today, uh, would you change anything to the software architecture or if any changes at all? Well, that's a really good question, and I haven't thought about it enough to give it the answer it deserves. I think I'd start by seeing what's being done today and seeing if there are much better ideas around, and if so, I would you know, start with them. <coughs> yes? Why is it, do you think, intelligent mobile robots hasn't taken off? I'm glad you asked that question, and it's not planted. So um, <laughs> let, me, let me kind of um, pitch my... Um, thoughts on that. So, Shaky was done in an era when artificial intelligence robotics were not separate fields. But not much after Shaky, they started to separate. Or kind of towards the end of Shaky, they started separating. And what's considered robotics today is things like motion planning and bipedal stability and things like that, which are really hard problems and have a set of mathematical and other techniques associated with them with, which allows it or requires it to be its own discipline. And the artificial intelligence part has been pushed off into separate fields. Nowadays the big deal in AI of course is deep learning, for example. Uh, and, and those two fields are really quite different. And so I was at a conference just a week or two ago with some robotic stuff was there. And there's really, from what I could see, virtually no autonomy in the current generation of robots, or any of the previous generation of robots, or in fact, not much going all the way back to Shakey or maybe to Stanford Cart. And so a lot of um, thought leaders in AI and robotics um, believe, and I certainly believe it too, that it's really time for these two now quite separate disciplines to converge. Uh, we need all of the robotics bag of tricks to create dexterous, stable, and so forth robots, uh, but we need all the AI bag of tricks to give them autonomy, or at least semi-autonomy, and to give them a really good ability to perceive their surroundings. So I hope the next generation of robotics includes um, what's been missing up to now. Yes? field of AI that's kind of in intermingled with the physical reality, like the, the robotics and artificial intelligence have to be grown together. Well, there's a philosophical view, and this is Bert Dreyfus's view, that without a sort of a sentient being that can feel and operate in the real world, AI is impossible. I've never particularly bought that argument for all sorts of reasons. But um, I'm not sure exactly what the thrust of your question is, do I, do I think? Is that, you kind of seem that Robotics and artificial intelligence have to you know, talk to each other, those two fields? I'd like to see them more than talk to each other. I'd like to see integrated systems being built that are modern incarnations of Shaky with technology that's 45 years newer, with robotics um, control techniques that are you know, so far beyond anything that existed then, and that have the ability, as I said, to be, I mean, I would, personally, I would like to see humanoid, semi-autonomous robots. Uh, and I'd, and um, I'd like to see elder care as a presenting grand challenge that motivates a worldwide research community. Um, one thing you'll find when you do a lot of research 
is that the experimental domain that you pick really shapes the kind of techniques that get developed. So if you're trying to solve problem A, it's not usually a good idea to say, I'll develop everything in domain B and then transfer it. You're better off saying, I'll start with a simplified version of A and then grow the complexity there because everything, will, everything you do will be shaped by that problem domain. So that's, that's personally what I'd like to see happen. Yes? So humanoids, because we're human and you're trying to get us to take care of humans. No, humanoid because I want them to be able to exist in living spaces that humans already exist in. Okay. So if form factors are too dramatically different, they just don't fit the, now. The, the human form is actually like pretty poorly engineered. Is there anything that you would change? <laughs> Sure, get rid of knees. <laughs> That's the worst. That, I mean, knees and shoulders are the worst designed yeah. parts of the human. Human human design pretty much argues is a really good argument against the designer. Well, I, I, I don't, I don't, um, I don't insist on on bipedal locomotion. I mean, maybe it should wheel around, but I, but in particular, I want to see robots develop that can fit in human living spaces. Okay. So these gigantic exoskeletons, for example, don't. Yeah. So I want something that could live in an unmodified home. Okay, all right. That's really what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. If you look at the, uh, the last DARPA challenge, the, I guess, Korean robot that had wheels on his knees yeah. was the winner. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's fine. Okay. Yes. No, I don't know that. I don't know the state of the art there. I'm sorry, I can't comment. Yeah. Tough work, right? Tough work. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Where do you look to find uh, what's being done in elder care? <coughs> I don't have a good single source. Um, there are some entry points. Uh, the U.S. Government has something that they call the ADLs, the Activities of Daily Living, uh, which are things like getting dressed and eating and stuff like that, maybe half a dozen or so. And so you start look at who's trying to automate, or not really automate, but who's trying to help with those Activities of Daily Living is one entry point. Um, but there's no, there's no single source that I know of, and I'm not even sure if there's conference solely devoted to that. Maybe there is in Japan. Let's see what, yes? Uh, do you think uh, the robotics uh, singularity, is it, uh, is it still possible? With the singularity? singularity? Well, that's another long discussion about the singularity. And if the singularity occurs, I guess we'll, you know, have a whole different reality to deal with. But um, I'm not going to wait for the singularity while we still, you know, work on better robots. <laughs> yes? If you were designing something today, would you want the processing to be on board, or would you want it to be off board, like shaky, on some sort of cloud infrastructure? I'd, I'd probably look at, uh, at um, a mixed architecture that had, uh, had uh, cloud control because of the obvious advantages and several senses of that. But, I mean, you can put so much on board now. I mean, how many cores are in your pocket right now on your phone or something? So. I would do locally what I could, but I would I would try to make use of uh, cloud-based stuff. Yes. Uh, the idea of, co of uh, cooperative robotics or cobots started to get interesting. Yeah. How does this fit into the mixture? I don't know. That's a. I, I think I think that's an example of domain-driven architectures where if you have, for example, things like um, search problems, like the quintessential, you know, where's the bomb, or something like that, or the leak, uh, you might want to have a swarm. Um, but um, there are other, other domains like this elder care, where I don't think it makes much sense uh, in a single home to have a swarm of robots. So. I think it's more of a case of the single robot that is essentially designed to work in cooperation with the human, which would seem to be oh. fit with the uh, Yes, yes, I'm oh, sorry, I misunderstood your question. Yes, I think that's an important avenue of research. There are people, people at MIT, for example, who work on things like that. Cynthia Brazil's work, for example, 
um, and some people in Japan working on things like that. Yeah. I mean, having this habitability thing, being able to have a human get accustomed to what the robot can do and cannot do, and so forth, I think is a very important area of research. Yes? So, uh, when Rob Brooks wrote Elephants Don't Play Chess, a lot, a lot of it was basically saying all this building a world model and then reasoning about it is, is pretty silly. The best model of the world is the world. And so, um, I'm curious, do you, how, mu how much of that do you buy into? Do you still like the world modeling idea? And how much world modeling do you think is the right amount to be doing? Well, I think, again, it's, do it's domain dependent. If you want to build vacuum cleaners, I think he's right. Um, but if you want to have robots do things that require planning, it has to be able to have a model that allows it to um, represent what future states are possible and which future states are desirable and what's the sequence of action that gets you to the desired goal state. So I don't really see how you do that. I mean, like, um, you, would you want to do blind search in a real world just for route planning because you don't want to look at a map? I mean, that seems not the right idea. Well, thanks again for inviting me. It's been a great discussion.